This video was made possible by the award-winning strategy game Total War Rome Remastered, where you can direct your armies to overcome your foes using tactical warfare. Roman Legionary, 1st century BC to the 3rd century AD. Since its earliest history, the term legion has been heavily associated with the Roman military. Whether it denoted entire armies in the formation years of the Roman Republic, or the more elite forces we have come to associate with the period of the Roman Empire. The form and structure of the elite Roman Empire was established in the late 2nd century BC by Consul Gaius Marius, implementing the significant Marian reforms of the Roman military. These reforms gave birth to the legionary, the first professional standard of soldier to serve in Rome's now permanent standing armies. The evolution of the military would play a pivotal role in helping to reshape Rome's prestigious future. At the head of a legion, Julius Caesar rose to prominence as dictator of Rome, while his heir apparent Octavian Augustus would later use his influence as military commander to complete the transformation of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. Serving as trailblazers in the early years of the empire, Roman legions spearheaded imperial expansion, allowing Rome to dominate much of Europe and beyond in the classical era. The identity of the legion even outlived the fall of Rome in 476 AD and continued to survive in the Eastern Roman Empire until the 7th century when its formal use was retired. The basic unit of the legion was the century, each having 80 men. Six centuries were organized in a group called a cohort, consisting of 480 men. Each legion had 10 such cohorts. The total number of 4,800 men plus around 480 cavalrymen in a legion fluctuated as legions were often under strength due to combat casualties. Each century was commanded by a centurion. The most senior centurion was the Primus Pilus, the first spear, whose century contained the standard bearer, the symbol of a legion. All centurions were subdued to the commander of the entire legion, called a legate. The common belief was that Roman legionaries were recruited among Roman citizens from towns and cities. While for a long time that was true, after the reforms of the military, a large number of them were not Roman citizens, and even less of them came from urban areas. In ancient Rome, cities included urban areas along with large rural territories attached to them, hence the urban origin of legionaries. Legion commanders preferred recruiting lower classes in their ranks, as these men were accustomed to hard life and heavy work. Their simple-mindedness was also a preferable trait in maintaining the high level of obedience in a legion. The precondition of being a Roman citizen was also contentious. As the Roman territories increased and therefore their military engagements, the need for new troops surpassed the capacities of Italy as a traditional base for recruiting legionaries. Very often, legates were forced to gather recruits from the local population in regions where they were conducting their campaigns. Truth be told, these men, once their service ended, would receive Roman citizenship. The only important thing was that the recruit was a freeborn man. Important prerequisites for joining a legion were the age and physical features of the recruit. The ideal legionary was 5 feet 10 inches in height, or 6 Roman feet, and had to be strong enough to withstand the extreme physical and mental exertion required on long campaigns and life in distant regions. Recruits became acquainted with the hard life already during their initial training period, which lasted for four months. During that time, recruits were drilled in endurance, battle tactics, and weapons handling, among other military skills. The training began with marching exercises on a daily basis. Each recruit had to be able to march 20 miles in five hours and 24 miles in the same period of time at a faster pace. While marching, recruits were loaded with roughly 60 pounds of weight in order to get accustomed to the weight of the armor, weapons, and rations. During the march, legionaries had to keep their ranks at all times. Once they mastered the military step, legionaries learned various unit formations. Legionaries had to know how to switch from one formation to another while moving, only by the sound of a trumpet or wave of a flag. The most important part of this course was to learn how to attack the enemy in formation while keeping it together under any pressure. There was also a higher level course of weapons handling called Armatura. The next phase of the training included a weapons course. Twice a day, recruits learned to handle weapons with an accent on protecting the body with a shield while fighting. 
Instead of slicing, recruits were taught to stab the opponent with their swords as it inflicted more severe wounds and required less exposure. Instead of real weapons, recruits used much heavier wooden replicas of swords, javelins, and shields. This resulted in a much better performance with real weapons when it came to it. All recruits had to master handling other weapon types as well, such as slings and the bow and arrow. Other courses included overcoming obstacles, swimming, and building field fortifications. The intense training continued even once recruits became regular soldiers, miles. During their campaigns, legionaries maintained daily weapon drills. It was primarily because of this high level of training and discipline that the Roman legions became the most formidable force of their time. In the Roman Empire, all citizen males who hit puberty were liable for military service. Once enlisted, they remained in the legions for the next 16 years. In decades to come, the service extended to 20 years and then again to 25 years. For their loyal service, legionaries received an annual pay of 900 sesterces. This sum was reduced by the cost of equipment, food, burial fee, and some for the regimental savings bank. After the service had ended, legionaries received a proper payoff. At the beginning, this was a piece of land for veterans to settle and build a farm of their own. During Augustus's reign, a change was made, and veterans began to receive a cash discharge bonus of 12,000 sesterces. Now and then, there were cases where veterans still received land bonuses for their discharge. Tunics worn by legionaries were not too different from those of ordinary citizens. It was the belt, balteus, and the sandal boots, caligae, that made the legionaries' appearance distinctive. They were a symbol that you belong to the military. If a soldier was discharged dishonorably, his belt was confiscated as he was not deemed worthy anymore of wearing it. Belts were made either as a single waist type or as a two-crossed belt, with silver or bronze embossed plate decorations and an attached apron made in the same fashion. They were used for carrying a dagger and a sword. Sandaled boots, as another distinctive feature of legionary clothing, allowed legionaries to weather long marches on various types of terrain. These heavy-duty sandals, outsoles, were made of one piece of cowhide or oxhide. They were attached to thick leather soles with hobnails. The sound of these hobnails announced the arrival of the legionaries. Armor was an important part of the legionaries' equipment. It protected his upper body in battle. It came in three different versions. The most recognizable was a cuirass made of segments, lorica segmentata. The cuirass consisted of metal plates and hoops fastened to internal leather strips. The design allowed adequate mobility in combat, but its protection was limited to torso and shoulders only. The weight of the cuirass was about 20 pounds, or 9 kilograms. There's a lot of controversy about how common cuirasses were among legionaries. It's more plausible that they used iron ringmail shirts, lorica hamtata, on a far larger scale. Mail shirts were made both sleeveless and with short sleeves, and were long enough to cover the thighs. The shoulder region was reinforced with additional pieces of leather faced with rings. The standard male shirt consisted of around 30,000 rings and weighed up to 33 pounds or 15 kilograms. The third type of armor was a scale armor, Lorica squamata. It consisted of a number of small iron scale-like plates attached to a thick doublet made of linen and stuffed with wool. It was worn in combination with peterouge, overlapping leather strips attached to the edges of the armor to protect the upper parts of the arms and legs. This type of armor was the cheapest and provided the least protection. The shield, the scutum, provided the legionary extra protection. The scutum was made of three layers of wood in a crosswise arrangement and was faced with felt and calfskin on the outer surface. The shield was slightly thinner on the edges than at the center where it had a prominent wooden boss. At the beginning, the scutum had an oval shape and was curved, but in the Augustan age, it took the shape of a curved rectangle. The size of the shield varied. Usually, it was around 2.5 feet or 76 centimeters in width, and 4 feet or 120 centimeters in length. The variety of sizes and materials used to construct it affected the weight of the shield, which varied from 12 pounds to 22 pounds, or 5.5 to 10 kilograms. Because of the weight, shields were held by the horizontal grip with a straight arm. Shields were used not only to protect from enemy blows, but also for hitting and toppling the enemy. Helmets The last piece of protective equipment went through several modifications. At first, legionaries wore the so-called Montefortino helmets, simple helmets with long cheek pieces and a small rear peak. These helmets were replaced with Kulus helmets, and later by the famous Imperial Gallic helmets. 
These helmets had increased protection with significantly larger rear peaks, brow peaks, larger cheek pieces with hinged throat flanges, and ear holes. Gallic helmets were distinctive for embossed eyebrows on the front part. A later version of this helmet was known as the Imperial Italic Helmet. The weight of the full equipment plus the weapons was 67 pounds, or 30.4 kilograms, a pretty heavy burden for a legionary in battle, and especially when marching. If carrying his leather pack with spare clothes, cooking utensils, mess kit, and rations, the weight increased to 97 pounds, or 44 kilograms, and even more if a legionary had to carry his entrenching equipment. Javelin The pilum was a distinctive weapon of a legionary. There were two types of pilums a heavy one for close combat, and a lighter one used by skirmishers for throwing. Heavy pilums were more than 6 feet long, or 1.8 meters, and consisted of a wooden shaft and a 1.3 to 3 foot or 40 centimeter to 90 centimeter long iron shank, with a pyramidal point that was either tanged or socketed into a wooden shaft. With an average weight of 4.4 pounds or 2 kilograms, this kind of pilum was strong and designed to punch through the enemy shield and armor. Another type of much lighter throwing javelin appeared in the late 1st century and was known as a lancia. The introduction of this weapon led to the formation of a new type of soldier in legions in the early 3rd century, called lanciari. After the initial pilum attack, legionaries would use their swords, the gladius. Contrary to popular belief, the gladius was not necessarily a short sword. The earliest Roman sword, the so-called Spanish sword, Gladius Hispaniensis, was a medium-length sword with a blade length of up to 27 inches, or 69 centimeters, and a width of 2 inches, or 5 centimeters. The blade was either straight or with slightly wasted edges. During the reign of Emperor Augustus, these swords were replaced with the Mainz Fulham-type Gladius. Its blade was shorter at 16 to 22 inches, or 40 to 56 centimeters, but much broader at 3.2 inches, or 8 centimeters. The Pompeii type was the lightest version, as its blade was 16.5 to 21.5 inches, or 42 to 55 centimeters long, but only 2 inches or 5 centimeters wide. All types were used in the same cut and thrust technique. Swords were held in metal scabbards with wooden or leather inserts. Scabbards had four rings that were used to attach to the belt. Legionaries carried their swords on the right, contrary to the officers who carried them on the left. In the same fashion but on the opposite side, a legionary carried his dagger, the pugio. In essence, this was a miniature gladius with a wasted blade 12 inches or 30 centimeters in length. Hard training, tactics, and weaponry were all important reasons behind the success of Roman legions, but it was the feeling of comradeship and belonging to the unit that drove the legionaries into battle. When joining a legion, each legionary swore two oaths. The first was to obey his consul, and the second was to his manipularis, comrades from the maniple, never to abandon a comrade, and never to abandon his place in the battle, unless to recover a weapon or to save a friend. The legionary fought first for his comrades, then his century and legion, then for glory, and finally, for the emperor and the state. The bond between legionaries was built on a daily basis. The Contubernium, a group of eight men that shared a single tent, was the basic group around which this bond was created. These men slept, ate, trained, and spent their time together and ultimately fought shoulder to shoulder on the battlefield. Disregarding this bond by showing cowardice in battle or neglecting one's duties was punished with the greatest severity. The worst of the punishment was Fustuarium execution by being beaten to death by the soldiers whose lives were endangered by the coward's axe. This group of soldiers had a bond that spread throughout the entire century. Belonging to a specific century and legion was of great importance to the legionaries. They cherished the traditions and the identity of their units through their specific emblems, numerical identification, and title. To a legionary, his century and legion were his home. Everyone in it was Comolito, a fellow soldier, no matter what his rank was. Thanks again to Total War, Rome Remastered, for making this video possible. If you want to play your own part in Roman history, check out the link in the description below. It's time to retake your empire, Commander.